Hello again, everyone. So today what I'm planning on doing here is giving you like the shortest history of Europe to the Renaissance, really from the classical period that I can, just as a short, short primer for a class. And and you can feel free to look up anything extra that you want, but this is just, again, a real basic intro. So what we're going to talk about first is the classical period where Greece and Rome do a lot of cool stuff and there are a lot of achievements there. And this is kind of like the foundation of what many people refer to as Western civilization. OK, and, you know, that's something that you need to think about there from the Philosoraptor. All right, so Greece, I mean, it, it's amazing what we get from Greece, um, whether it's philosophy, science, sculpture, literature, and government. You know, what you see in Greece is an appreciation for knowledge and learning. Um, the Greeks were humanists, which we will be talking about in class during the Renaissance. And the idea of humanism is really simply trying to understand why people do the things they do and, and why are we here? And, you know, whether it's philosophers like Socrates and Plato and Aristotle who look at human nature, who look at the role of governments and Aristotle who looks at things additionally like philosophy, you know, or not looks at additional things to philosophy like biology and embryology and things like that. What those philosophers gave us was that search for knowledge and the search for truth. Now, these guys aren't really big experimenters as much. It's more or less observation and then explaining what you get from that. But they you know, do some incredible things. And when you look at the, the science and math crew from Pythagoras to Euclid to Democritus to Archimedes, I mean, Pythagoras, so many of you know, Euclid basically structures most of the geometry that we use today. Democritus was a guy that theorized the concept of the atom before anything, um, which is incredible. Archimedes, with his use of um, various geometric ideas to do feats of engineering, and really when we look at stuff that comes down from him, was pretty close to figuring out calculus. Um, incredible sculptures, probably Phidias is the most you know, the most uh, famous one there. And then you also have literature, people like Euripides, Aeschylus, Sophocles, Homer, and Herodotus, you know, whether it's like nonfiction stuff like the histories that Herodotus did, um, or the epics of Homer, or the plays of Euripides, Aeschylus, and Sophocles. You know, we have the birth here of, of Western literature and the idea of, you know, we look at literature to understand culture, we look at literature to understand values and morals. And it's pretty, pretty impressive. And that, so government, you do have the famous Athenian democracy, which is not like a democracy we use today. Um, also, if you were a woman or a slave, you had no rights, but you know, you had to start somewhere, I guess. And then you have places like Sparta and other, other places that had not so much, much democracy that were ruled by kings. But this uh, period was incredibly influential and, and it eventually led to Rome. Okay, uh, Rome is huge, okay? They're, they're one of the largest empires of, of history, very, very long-lived. Um, the first phase of Rome was a republic, which I'll talk about more later. The second phase was an empire. And one of their biggest influences to us today was the development of law codes and codifying law, working on precedent, using judges, things like that, and much of Roman law comes down and is influential today. Uh, they were incredible architects. Um, of course, the most notable being, as you see here, the picture on the right is the Pantheon of Rome, and that is one of the world's first domes. And the Pantheon of Rome, that dome would actually be the biggest dome in the world until the Astrodome was built in the 1970s in Houston, Texas. And a lot of this being done by one of their key ingredient, not ingredients, uh, innovations being concrete. Um, also, their road system. I mean, they built 48,000 miles of roads to link up their empire. And it was just beyond belief. I mean, Rome was a city that right around the first century had well over a million people. Uh, it, it was absolutely incredible. And 
they are very influential in modern Republican governments that we see today. You do see people voting. Could everybody vote in Rome? Of course not. There were property restrictions and things along that line, so everybody wasn't voting. But they had the senators who were most, mostly wealthy, called patricians at that time, and they ran the country. However, over time, there were major issues from the commoners. You had some revolts. You had borderline civil wars over proper representation. So yes, the idea of uh, protesting, if you will, or rioting for equal rights, that is not a modern thing. That's stuff that goes back to the people of Rome in the four and five hundreds BCE, so incredibly long time ago. And so eventually a new office was created, the tribunes, which um, the tribunes were people who were in the Senate and their job was to represent the common people. And if the Senate was passing a law that they felt was too discriminatory against commoners, they could veto it. So it was an, you know, so here we again, we have a balance of power. Um, it was led by two consuls, so you had an executive branch as well. And a lot of the core ideas that you see in most Republican governments today came from Rome. Now, eventually, Rome does fall apart. You've got disease. You've got a weakening army. You've got corruption in the government. I mean, at one point when they were an empire, they had a series of 24 emperors, 23 of whom were assassinated, and the one that wasn't assassinated died of the plague, so there you go. And then when you have all this, you have struggling army. You have struggling with disease. You have an ineffective government. You get a series of invasions of who are known as the barbarians, um, Goths and Vandals and Huns and Visigoths and, and Ostrogoths and all sorts of people that eventually fracture the empire. And the western half of the empire over here, this lighter brown, completely collapses. The right side over here, the Eastern Roman Empire, which becomes the Byzantines, will survive. Talk about them more when we get into Russia a little bit later on. But for right now, this is just what I need you to know. And Rome disappears. Now we go to something known as the Dark Ages or the Middle Ages with the loss of Rome. And the most important thing I do often try to say here is that you know, Eurocentric viewers will often try to talk about this concept of the Dark Ages as like it was this worldwide thing. Actually, if you go to China or the Americas or Northern Africa or the Islamic world, this was one of their highest points of learning, trade. It was incredible. But in Europe, it was pretty rough. Most of that was because of their government system called feudalism, which I'm not going to get into too much detail, you can feel free to look it up. But the problem with feudalism is simply this. It's a decentralized form of government that unfortunately really makes everything local, which can be okay to a certain degree where everybody kind of lives on a small village or a manor that's run by a noble. And if you got a good noble that runs everything, it can work out really great. If it doesn't, it won't. But it basically shuts down all trade. There's no more advances in science and medicine. Um... And the general concern of what happens here is that also with this decentralized rule, you often get lots of small wars, a fairly chaotic situation. We say that there are these things called England or France at this time or Spain or the Holy Roman Empire, but most people didn't see it that way. There was no unity, okay? These areas weren't nations. In other words, like people didn't identify themselves as being French or English. They identified themselves as living on a just, you know, whatever noble's land that they lived on. And so when we have that, you just don't have a, a lot of advancement that can happen. Okay, well, virus definition update, I guess that's good. But, you know, we're going to just keep going. Uh, we did have the Vikings, who were an interesting group of people who did a lot of conquering and pillaging. Um, fun fact, you see them wearing those hats. They didn't wear those hats. There is no evidence of those horned hats. They did use axes, um, and the Vikings actually kind of will help to end feudalism because people need to... Um, defend themselves so they need a better centralized government. The Vikings will eventually also help to reignite trade in the area, um, but they did you know, beat up quite a few people in the process. <laughs> 
one of the defining factors here, and we're going to talk about this a lot a little bit later as we get into the Reformation, is that the Catholic Church fills the void of the loss of Rome. Everyone, for the most part, in Western Europe, with the exception of a small amount of Jews and really small amount of Muslims, would be Catholic. And because of the structure of the Catholic Church with the Pope at the top and cardinals and bishops, they were run in a way that they could control everyone. Because here's the deal. On the you know base level, they control upwards of one-third of all of the land in Europe. They are making the equivalent of billions and billions of dollars a year because it, you were required to tithe to the church, so you had to give a minimum of 10% of your income. They also made money off their land, but they controlled the path for people to go to heaven. And so that was very, very important. Now, the Catholic Church would do a lot of good things. The monasteries would preserve learning, which I'll talk about later. The um, They would also help the poor and ill. Eventually, though, you will get some corruption that gets into it, which will get there. But when everyone in a continent is Catholic, that gives this church as an organization a remarkable amount of power. And, and it's almost impossible. I mean, the Pope in Rome in the Middle Ages, the only person I can equate him to power-wise would be like an Egyptian pharaoh. You know, he wasn't considered to be a god, but he was considered to be, the Pope considered to be God's representative on earth. And so it was really, really powerful. And we'll get into that more as well later on. Um, then you also have the Crusades. That was a big thing that went from 1095 to 1289. Here you see a map of the four bigger Crusades. There were others after that. Um, these were awful. They were periods of horrific violence. Um, the tensions that exist between much of the Western world and the Islamic world today go back to the time of the Crusades, um, and they were mostly fruitless. I mean, they would win, they being the Europeans, would win the first crusade, and then they would tie, if you will, on the third crusade, but then every other one, I think the record was like, they're like 1, 11, and 1. It was a brutal period. It was a fruitless period. But the only thing that they did get out of it is with interacting with the Muslims to a certain extent, because some of it would be through war, but some merchants would, would start to get themselves involved. Some of the ancient knowledge of Greece and Rome, as well as the advanced knowledge of the Muslims at this time, would start to seep its way into Europe, which ultimately would help them get out of this quote-unquote dark age. Um... Europe was lucky from 1223 to 1242 also. They were invaded by the Mongols. The Mongols would actually conquer Russia. They would go into Eastern Europe and destroy much of that. And actually, at one point in 1242, they destroy the largest army in all of Europe, that being the Hungarian army that had over uh, 100,000 men. And due to the, actually the death of their leader, they returned to Mongolia after 1242, and luckily enough for Europe, they do not return. Had they in turn returned, they probably would have conquered all of Europe, and we could have a very different history today. You also had a bizarre climatic thing that goes throughout Europe, something known as the Little Ice Age, which really sparks famines. It's helped to spark the Black Plague because of various famines and crop failures, um, forced Europeans to change their diets, um, some really, really fascinating stuff that, that we'll get into a little bit more in class, but this unique climate change that did occur uh, from like the 1300s through about the 1800s made for some fascinating changes in European culture. And of course, I mean, undoubtedly the largest single event was the Black Dead. Uh, the Black Death. Uh, this was the plague that arrived in the mid-1300s from Asia. It had, hadn't had been in Europe for quite a long, long time, probably back during the age of Justinian in the 500s, and it just killed tens of millions of people. It had huge social effects. Um, actually, skilled workers because so many people died, would start to gain more status. Merchants would start to gain more status. People actually started to question the strength of the church because it didn't seem that, you know, it was either did God send this plague on us or is the church not equipped to deal with it? Um, 
but you're looking at when it was all said and done, one third of the population of Europe was killed in about six years. I mean, this is just a staggering number. In some areas, you could see either 50 or 75% deaths, just beyond scary. Now, look, there's a bunch of other stuff, and I kind of highlighted some of the more positive things with the exception of, like, the Black Plague. And, of course, there's some negative things, too. You know, the Greeks and Romans weren't perfect. Um, they had their own issues that we can talk about. But the whole idea was to just give you kind of, like, this quick, quick tour of Europe. I have all this stuff here. If you're interested in these people, if you like history and you want to learn about the Middle Ages in Europe, because a lot of the things are fascinating, you, of course, could look at my AP World or AP European History um playlist on Mr. Lynn history to shamelessly plug myself or you could pick up this thing they're called books or you could use the internet for knowledge and not you know cat videos I'm just giving you an option here but there are some variety of people of what's going on here but that's again just to give you that quick quick um, so we can get in the, into the Renaissance and so you have a little bit of an idea of what is going on prior to the time period that we're going to talk about in class okay guys have a nice day, and I'll talk to you soon.